terrible title of the sermon. I mean, it's the Christian life. Well, every time we come to church and we hear a sermon, it's going to be that the Christian life. But I, I want to detail by saying the mark of a Christian life. And we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 3, verses 16 through 9, uh, 16 all the way through 23. The mark of a Christian life. We are different. As Christians, we should stick out as a green thumb in the world. When we are in the world, when we're in the workplace, when we go about, we should stick out like something completely out of place. In high school, the last thing you want to do in middle school is stick out. We think when we're in high school, we have all the different kinds of peer pressure, and people say it's get, it gets better when you, you, know, you leave high school, it gets better. But in high school, you want to fit in. You don't want to be the oddball out. Amazingly enough, I was the oddball out for all the wrong reasons. And my junior year, I realized I got into the job of music, and I just started dressing like all of my other friends. And there's a t-shirt, a flannel shirt over that, unbuttoned, untucked, with a pair of jeans that you never took off or ever washed. And I looked like a bum, but all my other friends looked like bums too. And we bought, bought clothes that made us look like bums. Oh, look, this shirt looks disgusting and dirty. I'll buy that $30, Let's put it on. We strive to fit in. And then we get a job. And you think, oh, I'm out of high school. I'm, I'm going to be able to be my own person. Or I'm going to go to college and I'm going to be my own person. And what do we do? We try to fit into whatever group we're with. We don't want to stick out. We don't want to be the oddball out in the crowd. But yet, a Christian should be. At the end of the day, when you go out of your house, you should stick out so differently than everyone else around you. People should say there's something different about that person. They should be drawn to you because you're so different. You know, a lot of times we have the Christian life on uh, the picture be all the fish swimming one way and one fish swimming the opposite way. We should be different. And 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 23 talks about the difference in our Christian life. So let's read 1 John chapter 3, starting. In verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whenever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of Jesus Christ and love one another, as he gave us commandments. Let's pray. Father God, as we look at 1 John chapter 3, open our hearts, open our minds to what your word has to say. Give me the words to speak, that we may apply it to our lives and live for you. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Love. We talk about love often, and there's a reason for it. Because it is the cornerstone of our lives. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Love is fundamental. And it's not just a love like I love cookies. In fact, I love ginger cookies. Like ginger snaps? Oh man, they're my kryptonite. They're so good. The taste of ginger and a little cookie form. Man, I'm there. I'm not talking about a love for like a cookie. It's a love of service. 
a sacrificial love. It's that Vern and I are sitting there and I pull out a bag of my ginger snap cookies and Vern goes, oh, those cookies look good. I go, they are good, Vern. They're really good. I only have one left. Man, I love a ginger snap cookie. I bet you would, Vern. <laughs> what I would love, sacrificial love, would be for me to give Vern the last cookie. It's a small act, right? But it's a sacrifice. It's something I have that someone else doesn't, and I give to them. I give to where it hurts, where it's a cost. I don't give out of the abundance. I give out of cost, something that's actually going to cost me. And so 1 John chapter 3, 16 starts out with what is love? <coughs> we know this love because he laid down his life for us. He sacrificed for us. And his sacrifice, his love, was his death. The first act of love that we knew was a sacrifice of life. We know this love because he laid down his life for us. He served us by dying. And then he goes on to say, verse 16, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now this word brethren is talking about other Christians. Now this doesn't mean that we, don't, we only die for Christians, but he's specifically talking to the church. And he's saying that our love for the church should be the way God loved us. Willing to die for our members. Holding nothing back. That if one of us is in need, even if he kills me, I'm willing to do it. Willing to do it. You know, we ask people to serve at church sometimes. And so, oh, yeah, we need someone to join this committee. Anyone want to volunteer? And all of a sudden, the most exciting thing going on is something on the ground. Something in the bulletin. <laughs> what is this? Oh, there's words. Oh, if I look at this, they're not going to see me. They're just going to be calling someone else. Or we all turn around. Oh, Barbara will volunteer. Barbara's willing to do that. That is very good at pointing to Barbara. Jokingly, I say that. But when it comes time for service, all of a sudden we hide. We duck and cover. Service. Love is service. And when we have a chance, we should jump at it, even if it means our death. That's the kind of love that God is talking about here. We know love because he laid down for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Love is sacrifice. Love is sacrifice. Not only that, look at verse 17. It says, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Let's work on it, work through this slowly here. It says, whoever has this world's goods, the ability to fulfill a need, money, maybe it's something else, maybe it's shoes, maybe it's a jacket, maybe it's food. If you have something that can fulfill someone's need and we don't do it, what does it say? How does the love of God abide in him? Remember 1 John chapter 1 and 2, we talked about being in the light as he is in the light. Knowing God, having a close relationship with God. How can we say we have this kind of love relationship with God if we see people in need and we do nothing about it? And remember, we're talking about people in the church right now. This isn't a stranger driving we drive by down the road. This is our brethren. People in the pews next to you. If someone has a need in this church and we have the ability to take care of that need and we don't, how does the love of God abide in us? In the Gospels it says, God says that we need to love one another. And, you know, it says that Jesus says we need to love our neighbor. It actually, Jesus says to me, you need to love your brother. And one of the men says, well, who's my brother? And Jesus says, your neighbor. We can apply that same thing here. 
If we see someone, first and foremost, a member of our church, a Christian, but if we see someone outside our church that needs something, and we have the ability to do it, and we don't, how does the love of God abide in us? The point is this. When we see a neighbor in need, and we have the ability to fill it, we do it. We don't hold back. We don't say, well, you know what? I was going to buy a chicken sandwich with this. No. If you see a need, we fill it. <coughs> the whole point of the Christian life is love. And love is sacrificial service. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says this. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And I think this is, in my opinion, when we look at the Christian life and the Word of God, I think this is one of the most important verses in the Christian life, is my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Love is action. We can talk about love all day long, and I know I have talked about love a lot from this pulpit. Love is sacrifice, but more than that, love is action. Love is doing something. It's not standing here and doing nothing and just talking about it. It's important for us to talk about love. It's important for us to understand what love is and how we are to do it. But you know what's more important? That we actually go out and do it. We're not to talk about love only. You have to actually go and do it. You can't be having a close relationship with God if you don't actually go out and love someone. Which means serve someone. You can't. The biggest demonstration that we have of love is Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He served people. He served his disciples and he served complete strangers. Think about when he was preaching and it was dinner time. People are hungry. What did he do? He said, you know what? We need to get some food. And a little boy said, you know what? Here's an act of love. Take my dinner. Some fish and some bread. And what does Jesus do? He gave it to over 5,000 people. He served people. He washed the disciples' feet. His whole ministry was <laughs> just dedicated to service to the point that he died for us. The biggest act of love is sacrifice. If that is what he did, and we're to follow his example, this verse lines right up in there. My little truth was not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Action, action, action. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. The action, our actions assure us that we have a close relationship with God. Remember, we're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Our works show us our faith. And this is what James, the book of James talks about, is our works show what we believe. Now, I want to be very clear here. I'm not saying work salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. We are saved by faith and faith alone. People see our faith by what we do. That's how we stick out like a sore thumb, by our actions. The things that we do should point people to Jesus. Let, the book of Matthew says, Let your light shine upon men so they see God and glorify Him. Your works in the community, at your job, wherever you are, should bring people to Christ. If you're a parent, the way you work, the way you live, should take our children and say, I think there's something different about that. Why are you that way? It should point our children to Christ. I'm a, I'm able to work from home, and so I'm a stay-at-home dad. And I love it. I get three little kids to hang out with me. The problem is that three little kids watching me every single day. Grace sits here and listens to my sermons. Today, I'm going to go home and she's going to watch how I live. Monday, she's going to watch how I live. And she's going to either see a hypocrite 
or she's going to see someone living this out, pointing her to God. If you have kids, every day they're going to watch you. And they're going to say, wow, this, you know, I understand who God is by what my mom and dad are doing. Or, man, we go to church, but they, they just live whatever they want. They just don't care. Our coworkers, <coughs> our roommates, our friends at school, the people we interact with, when we're around them, they're either going to be pointing and saying, there's something different about this person. There's something that is just completely odd. Or they're going to be like, this is just a regular person. Nothing different about them. Our actions dictate what people think. And they should see our actions and be drawn to God. Christian life is love. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Love isn't just action. Love is forgiveness. How many times have we failed? How many times have we not shown love? How many times have we lost our temper and we know it inside? We know from there our conscience is pricked, we're burdened. We know that we messed up. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Think about Peter. Before Pentecost, Peter was a hot-headed man. He lost his temper all the time. Before Jesus was arrested, the Lord came to Peter and said, You're going to deny me three times. For the crow, the chicken cocks, and Peter said, I'd never do that. Well, that night, he had three chances to <coughs> say, Yes, I'm with him, but he denied Jesus three times. And then Peter went out and was just guilty. Well, Jesus rose again, they're standing on the side of the Sea of Galilee, there's some fish cooking, and Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, oh, yeah, I love you. Jesus then looked again at Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? And then a third time, Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? Now this, Peter was greatly disturbed because he knew what he did. He denied Jesus three times. And Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Peter just went, you know all things. And John is alluding to this, saying this, you know what? We're going to mess up. But God is greater and will forgive you when you mess up. Because that's what love is, is forgiveness. Love is sacrifice. Love is action. And love is forgiveness. God knows we're going to mess up. We're going to lose our temper. We're not going to show love. But don't worry. We are forgiven. Moving on, after he talks about what love is and how we need to demonstrate that, he turns to prayer. Verse 21 through 23 says this, starting in verse 21. Beloved, if our, hearts, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whenever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us a commandment. Verse 21 says this. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. If we're living right, and we know that we are loving one another sacrificially, and we're serving others. We're demonstrating love. That means we are walking in the light as He is in light. We have a close relationship with God and we're where we're supposed to be. When we have a right relationship with God, we are in the light as He is in the light. Verse 22 says this. If we're doing that, whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. When we are walking in the light as He is in the light, we have a right relationship with God, we pray for something, we'll get it. 
Now, this is not a magic genie. This does not mean that if you're in need, you just rub the magic lamp and God's going to say, well, maybe you want $500. Walk in light, here's your $500. That's not what it's talking about. When we are in the light, we are loving others. We are serving others. We are serving God. Our lives are dedicated to following after His will. When we pray, we're going to ask for things not for personal desires, but for what's going to benefit God the most. And He's going to answer us. Think about it like this. You're in the light. You're loving people. You're reading your Bible. You have a good prayer life. You're doing everything right. And you go, you know, I'm a witness to someone today. God, bring someone into my life that I may share the gospel with and let them be receptive to it. God's going to answer that. He's going to give you that opportunity. When we are walking in the light, as He is in the light, our desires and God's desires are going to line up. And when we pray for something, He will grant it to us. Why? His desires will be our desires, and we're only going to want to do what glorifies Him. If we want answer prayer, we need to line our lives up with God. His desires become our desires, and our prayers will match His will. Verse 23 gives us the recipe for this, for answered prayer. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. There's two things. We should believe on the Son, and love one another. Love one another. The recipe for, for answered prayer is simple. It's very simple. You just need to do two things. You have to be a Christian. Believe on who Jesus is. What he's done for you. What did he do? He died on the cross for you. He forgave your sins. He rose again on the third day. And then love one another. If you're a Christian, and you are serving others, your prayers will be answered. That's not what I'm saying. That's what the Word of God says. Verse 23. And this is a commandment that you should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. If we want to answer prayer, that's what we need to do. Believe in Jesus and love one another. That is what God wants. So my question is, why are our prayers not being answered? Well, we ask for personal gain. We're living outside the light of God. We're not caring for others. Our lives are based on selfish desires, selfish wants, selfish needs. But yet we still go to church. We go to Wednesday night service. We show up to Sunday school. I serve on all these committees. I'm doing all this for the association. But my prayers aren't being answered. You have to ask yourself this. Am I living in the light of the Lord? Am I loving others? Are the things I'm doing to promote myself or to promote God? Am I loving in word and deed? Or is it all this word? When I see a need, do I fill it? The way we do this is simple. We have to ask ourselves this. Are my eyes open? Are my ears open? Is my heart open? Are my eyes open to see the needs of others? Am I actually looking and asking people how they're doing? You know, if you see someone, I'm just going to use Pam as an example. Pam, I hope you don't mind. I say that, but I already said I'm a user as an example, so if she did mind, well, it's too late. <laughs> so Pam comes in, and her shirt's ripped, her pants are all dirty, covered in mud, and you look out, there's her car, it's missing a tire. Hey, Pam, how you doing? Hope you have a good day. And we walk away. Our eyes are not open to Pam having a physical need. Her car obviously had some kind of issue in the parking lot. There's a chance for us to fill in. Do you need a ride 
to uh, get home? Do you need a ride to the tire shop? Do you need to go get that for you? Open your eyes to those around you. We might be able to just literally see a need. There's Barbara. She's trying to open up a thing of pickles. She wants a dill pickle and is stuck in that jar. And she... And Dave walks by and goes, hey, look for a pickle. They're good. And he keeps on walking. He literally is blind to the need that she has. An act of love is opening up a jar of pickles. She has a need to get a pickle. She can't do it. But Dave Edwards is like, good luck, get me muscles. That is literally being blind to the needs of the members. Open our eyes. Where is there a need? And how can we fill it? Not only do we need to open our eyes, we need to open our ears. We heard that Bo Treadway is going to be having surgery. There's going to be a need there. You've heard it. What are you going to do? We heard that Jamie Powell had a beautiful little baby. Nine pounds, three ounces, 21 inches. It's like a little six-month-old. <laughs> she might have some needs in the coming future. You've heard that she's going to have a need. What are we going to do? We hear people have prayer requests every week. Do you just write it down and you go, how can I help them? When you're going out and about, Zach gave a prayer request about a coworker. If it, has anyone asked, how, what can I do to show them? How can I show them love? Maybe a little note saying, we're praying for you. When you're at work, you're going to hear about people having needs. What are you going to do about it? Now, sometimes we can't fulfill the need. Sometimes it's a need beyond our ability. That's fine. But if we have the ability to fulfill the need, if we see it, if we hear it, we should open our hearts and fulfill it. We've already believed that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for us. But now, it's the second part of verse 23. We have to love. We have to look. We have to listen. We have to open our hearts to be willing to sacrifice for other people. When we do that, God will answer our prayers. Then we will stick out like a sore thumb all around us. Because our lives will line up with God. Jesus, when he walked around, he stuck out like a sore thumb. People saw him coming. They knew he was coming to your town. They're like, there's this guy, Jesus, coming. Oh man, I tell you, we need to see this. He stuck out. Everywhere he went, he stuck out of the crowd. You can do the same exact thing. That everywhere you go, you stick out because your life is marked with the love of God. And when you pray, your prayers are answered. But to do that, we need to open our eyes. We need to open our ears. <coughs> open our hearts to fulfill the needs of others. Will you do that today? Will you say this week, I'm going to open my eyes, I'm going to open my ears, and I'm going to open my heart, and I'm going to seek out a need and fill it. Jesus sought out a need. He went to the world. He saw the need. He went to us and died for us. We need to do the same thing. We need to look for the need and fill it. Don't just wait for it to come to you. Look for it. Have a life marked by love. Open your eyes, open your ears, and open your heart. And in do that, we and by doing that, we'll walk in the love of the Lord, and our prayers will be answered. That's my challenge this week. Open your hearts, open your ears, open your eyes, and be marked by love. Let's pray. Father God. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 23, talk about love and prayer. How they go hand in hand. That if we want answered prayer, we need to have a life marked by love. A life that's in the light, walking in the light of your word. A close relationship with you. And that when we have this close relationship with you, we're serving others. And by doing that, you answer our prayers. 
Help us to open our eyes, open our ears and our hearts to the needs around us. And let us meet them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's no invitation today because this challenge is for everyone. This challenge is for everyone. Pray today. As Jennifer plays the piano, I want you to pray. And pray this, God, open my eyes, open my ears, and open my heart to the needs of those around me.